Good day to you all and top of the week to you all on this 26th day of September. It is day 269 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name's Hunter. I'm your brother, your Bible reading coach, someone who's showing up with you every day to spend some time together in the pages of the Bible. And I am glad you are here, glad that you're starting this week off with a heart that's ready to listen, a heart that's ready to respond and to receive. Today, we're going to look into the book of Haggai, chapters 1 and 2, then on to Psalm 129, and then we'll finish our reading in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. This is the word of the Lord. Haggai, chapter 1. On August 29th of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord gave a message through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. The people are saying, The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills. Bring down timber and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvest, but you were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. While all of you are busy building your own fine houses, it's because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olive trees and all your other crops, a drought to starve you and your livestock and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, and Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of God's people, began to obey the message from the Lord their God. When they heard the words of the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord their God had sent, the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the enthusiasm of Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. They began to work on the house of their God, the Lord of Heaven's armies, on September 21st of the second year of King Darius's reign. Haggai 2 Then on October 17th of that same year, The Lord sent another message through the prophet Haggai. Say this to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of God's people there in the land. Does anyone remember this house, this temple, in its former splendor? How in comparison does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. But now the Lord says, Be strong, Zerubbabel, be strong, Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. And now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. My spirit remains among you, just as I planned when you came out of Egypt. So do not be afraid. For this is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. In just a little while... I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The future glory of this temple 
will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, and in this place I will bring peace. I, the Lord of Heaven's armies, have spoken. On December 18th of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says. Ask the priest this question about the law. If one of you is carrying some meat from a holy sacrifice in his robes, and his robe happens to brush against some bread or stew, wine, or olive oil, or any other kind of food, will it also become holy? The priest replied, No. Then Haggai asked, If someone becomes ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person, and then touches any of these foods, will the food be defiled? And the priest answered, Yes. Then Haggai responded, That is how it is with this people and this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. Look at what has happened to you before you begin to lay the foundations of the Lord's temple. When you hoped for a twenty-bushel crop, you harvested only ten. When you expected to draw fifty gallons from the wine press, you found only twenty. I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything you work so hard to produce. Even so, you refuse to return to me, says the Lord. Think about this eighteenth day of December, the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Think carefully. I am giving you a promise now, while the seed is still in the barn. You have not yet harvested your grain, and your grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, and olive trees have not yet produced their crops. But from this day onward, I will bless you. On that same day, December the 18th, the Lord sent this second message to Haggai. Tell Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, that I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow royal thrones and destroy the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overturn their chariots and riders. The horses will fall and their riders will kill each other. But when this happens, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, I will honor you. Zerubbabel, son of Shiltil, my servant, I will make you like a signet ring on my finger, says the Lord. For I have chosen you. I, the Lord of Heaven's armies, have spoken. Psalm 129, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. From my earliest youth my enemies have persecuted me. Let all Israel repeat this. From my earliest youth my enemies have persecuted me, but they have never defeated me. My back is covered with cuts, as if a farmer had plowed long furrows, but the Lord is good. He has cut me free from the ropes of the ungodly. May all who hate Jerusalem be turned back in shameful defeat. May they be as useless as grass on a rooftop, turning yellow when only half-grown, ignored by the harvesters, despised by the binders, and may those who pass by refuse to give them this blessing. The Lord bless you. We bless you in the Lord's name. Luke chapter 10. The Lord now chose seventy-two other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag nor an extra pair of sandals. And don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Whenever you enter someone's home, first say, May God's peace be on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality, because those who work deserve their pay. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. But if a town refuses to welcome you, 
go out into its streets and say, We wipe even the dust of your town from our feet to show that we have abandoned you to your fate. And know this, the kingdom of God is near. I assure you, even wicked Sodom will be better off than such a town on Judgment Day. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Yes, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. Then he said to the disciples, Anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. When the seventy-two disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. At that same time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, and he said, O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, Thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever, and for revealing them to the childlike, Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then when they were alone, he turned to the disciples and said, Blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. I tell you, many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but they didn't see it, and they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. One day, an expert of religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with this story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, Yes. Now go and do the same. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary, listening to what he taught, 
But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. And now may our Lord give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. He's the neighbor we've all been waiting for. Blessed are the eyes that see what you've seen. Many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. That's what Jesus says to his disciples. So tell me, what do you see in this story of the Samaritan? Do you see yourself? A religious leader came and asked Jesus. He asked the question. He said, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He asked the question because he wanted to justify himself, we're told. But Jesus responds with the story of the Samaritan. In this story, Jesus is asking us, who do you see? We like to see ourselves as the ones who are the heroes of the story. We are the ones who will show mercy. We will be the good Samaritans. Somehow we've translated this gospel story into some kind of morality tale, as if Jesus is showing us how we can be the hero of the story. Avoid being a villain like those religious people, and you now be the hero. That's not what this story is about. No, this is a gospel story. This isn't a morality tale. And the story isn't about us. We're not the hero. No, we're the man lying in the ditch. We are the wounded man. We are the man that's just holding on, half alive, unable to help himself. It is God who is the Samaritan. God has shown mercy when we were exposed, beaten up, left half dead along the road. God is the hero in this story. It isn't us. This story is showing us what God is like. God is the one who justifies us, and God is the hero. The world and religion, they just walk on by, unwilling, unable to help us as we lie there. But God sees us. And Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to every bit of this story. Jesus is the neighbor we've been waiting for. And he's come, he's come to this far off land. And he's found us just as we are. And he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He lovingly, mercifully does all that's needed to ensure that we are healed. Jesus is the Good Samaritan, my friends. And ours is to rejoice in this gracious one who's come for you, who's come for me, who's come on behalf of this whole human race, all of us. And the prayer of my heart today is that I will see that each and every day, that I won't lose that plot. That's the prayer that I have for my family too, for my wife and my daughters and my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Hello, Hunter. Hey, Hunter. Hello, Brother Hunter. Hello, Hunter. This is Pauline Loney in Sherbrooke, Quebec. Hi, Hunter. It's Robert Benning. I'm just from Edison, New Jersey. I'm just saying hello. Hey, Hunter. This is Aaron Clifford calling. I'm calling from Beijing, China. Hi, this is Marie from New Zealand. Hi, Hunter. This is Francis Bala from Sharon, Massachusetts. Hello, Hunter. This is Melody from Switzerland. Hello, Hunter and Heather. This is Mallory from Warren, Michigan. Hey, Hunter and Heather. It is David Nevue. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing all right, David. And I sure appreciate you leaving that message. And to all of those who've called in and used that nifty little voicemail app, thank you very much. We love including your voice in this podcast. And speaking of David, who left that voicemail... David is the artist and composer of the music that we use in our Journey podcast. 
You can find out more about his music at davidnevu.com. It is absolutely beautiful music. And let me encourage you to head on over to his webpage and check it out. Well, before I check out, I just want to send a shout out to a few folks out there. These are partners to the DRB. These are folks that have given so that this podcast can give every day. This podcast and the others that we do every day exist because of you, because of the listeners. This is entirely listener supported. I know the name sounds like we're some big corporation or something, Daily Radio Bible, but the name is just a name. Who we are is Heather, myself, Finn the Wonder Dog, and you. That's it. Just us folks and the Holy Spirit doing this simple thing that God is leading us to do. And we've been doing it every day now for nine years. Incredible. So that is what makes up the DRB Nation. And I'm so grateful to be a part of it. And so a big shout out and thank you to Ron and Kim from Bayou Vista, Texas, to David Judah, Jamie Gobo, Carol Thibodeau, Jimmy and Amanda Mancusi, Dean and Ruth Cross, Natalie and Jeff Eckhart, and Jody Poundstone. Blessings, my brothers and sisters. And if you're listening to this and you would like to gift the DRB a one-time gift or a reoccurring gift, you certainly can. Just head on over to the webpage and click on that donate link and you will be on your way. Well, I'm going to be on my way now, but what do you say we all show up again here tomorrow and we'll do it again. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, I plan on being here. Until that time, let's go forward. Let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this. That you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care. Bye-bye.